And then it, when he gets on the phone, I think he tries to make up for the distance by talking even louder. Hi. Oh, hey guys. <laughs> What's up, Gretchen? Faces. Hello. Hi, Gretchen. It's Trish. Hey. Hello. Hey, Trish. Hey, I'm not showing my picture because I hate to admit I just got out of the shower. I got wet hair. <laughs> oh, that's totally cool. This is show up however you feel like it. <laughs> We're going to get started here. I'm going to try and make this as on time as possible for everyone. So it's 1159 and we are totally going to get started right at noon today. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Chris Stein. Long time hey. To see. hey. What's up? How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Oh, guys, this is going to be so much fun. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, honestly, I just have to tell you, when everything, you know, with COVID-19 happened, you know, like I imagine all of you were, I was also you know, like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, it, it's a big stress for all of us. Um, but something that's made me really excited is being able to do this because if it weren't COVID-19, I probably would have, selfishly, I probably wouldn't have done this. So this is going to be fun and we're going to learn a lot. So let me share my screen here. One second. Awesome. Can everyone see my PowerPoint? Yep. Yay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I know most of you know me probably decently well, but for anybody that doesn't, I just want to do a little intro. Um, my name is Gretchen Spetz, and I'm a registered and licensed dietitian nutritionist. I am all about a functional nutrition approach to health and getting at the diet and lifestyle related root causes of chronic problems that are keeping you from living your best life. Um, so a little bit about me. I've been a registered dietitian for almost 10 years and prior to starting my practice, the functional kitchen, I worked at the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospital. And I saw patients for weight management, GI issues, diabetes, autoimmune, uh, autoimmune conditions, and many other conditions. So at the Functional Kitchen, I work with you, the person who is interested in making changes to your diet and lifestyle to optimize your life and restore balance to your body. I feel like so often we go to the doctor, on some lab work, they take a look at us and they say, you're fine or no need to change your current meds. But maybe you feel, and honestly, I believe that you are the person that knows your body best. So maybe you know that you can feel better if you make those diet changes. Um, often it's hard to know where to start and that's where I come in. So um, I'm gonna make sure I put my timer on here because you know, you know me and you know I like to talk, so. 30 minutes, I promise. So today is all about nutritional strategies to promote a balanced life. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn about the HPA axis and the brain gut axis. So we're gonna learn a little bit of physiology here. We're gonna learn about nutritional strategies to combat fatigue and stress. And then we're gonna learn about my favorite things, adaptogens, how they support. So here we are, um, the effects of chronic stress. If I was going to edit this, I would absolutely put COVID-19 at the top of this list. This is definitely chronic emotional stress that we're all going through, chronic mental stress, sometimes physical stress as well. Um, we deal with these things all the time, though, so it's good to know about this anyways. Um, so other things that can trigger, be, be chronic stressful triggers for us, um, food sensitivities, gut imbalances, so too much bad gut bacteria, not enough good gut bacteria. Toxic overload, so maybe you've had mold exposure or you have um, too many heavy metals in your system, and also infections that you may not even know exist. So here you are, you know, juggling all the things, and I know everyone on this call is doing that as we speak. This activates our stress response. So what's happening? The HPA axis is activated. The hypothalamus, which is the H in HPA, releases corticotropin releasing factor. Um, that stimulates the pituitary gland to release adrenocorticotropic hormone. And that gives the adrenal glands the kick it needs to start releasing adrenaline. 
which is gonna trigger our fight or flight response. And we're also gonna be producing that cortisol. So ideally, this stress response is going to end. It's just gonna be short-term response, and then we'll return to our normal life and everything will be hunky-dory. But this isn't happening, right? Like the emotional stress, the mental stress, it doesn't go away. So this circle just continues. <clears throat> And we have sleep problems, anxiety, depression, brain fog, your sugar, fat, and salt cravings that just don't seem to go away, um, waking in the middle, hormone issues, metabolic syndrome, high blood pressure, and immune system issues. So we want to look at stress, and we want to look at ways that the diet can support stress. I just want to say we're just focusing on how diet can support stress today, but guys, there's so much other stuff out there that you can do from a lifestyle perspective. Regular exercise and movement is super important. Breathing practices. I'm not going to get into all this today, but definitely things. And when I forgot to mention questions, we will do questions at the end. So let's talk about the gut-brain axis. I think this is so interesting. There are 10 times the number of signals traveling from the gut to the brain versus brain to gut. So our gut is really calling the shots here. Um, the vagus nerve, all these, most of these um, neurotransmitters are tra traveling via the vagus nerve, which is our information superhighway. Um, let's start with what happens when we're stressed. We have more cortisol. That means we're going to have increased intestinal permeability. This is something that can trigger dysbiosis or an imbalance of good and bad gut bacteria in the gut. Um, sometimes this can trigger a mood change. So overgrowth of bad bacteria is linked to depression. Um, this can also trigger the immune system. This dysbiosis can trigger the immune system to upregulate our T cells, which are uh, an immune cell. Um, and this creates an inflammatory response in the gut that can travel up. This is one of my things I find fascinating, neurotransmitter production. So we all have heard of tryptophan. Tryptophan produces serotonin, so one of our happy hormones, and kynorenic acid. So if you have a lot of bad bacteria floating around, they're going to steal all the tryptophan and they're going to make more ky kynorenic acid, which is something you really don't need. So you end up with a decrease in serotonin. What we do know, we're just kind of at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to learning about probiotics, but we know we do know that lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, some of the good guys, those are important for production of GABA, which is one of our neurotransmitters that's going to help us return from flight or flight to the like normal state. Um, it's also important for production of serotonin and dopamine, happy hormones, and acetylcholine. So your gut is talking to your brain, your brain is talking to your gut, and all of this is very much impacted by stress. So what can we do from a foods perspective when it comes to this? First and foremost, and this can be really hard right now, but choosing whole foods. So when I'm talking about whole foods, I'm not talking about the grocery store, so that's fine. Um, but I'm talking about foods that have been minimally processed, so if we're talking about animal products, it's the stuff that isn't frozen with breading and um, have, you know, saline injections and other things added to it to make it last longer. I'm not talking about the fake box cheese type things that are in the store. So bags, boxes, and <laughs> uh, What I am talking about are fresh fruits and veggies. Frozen veggies are great too. Um, beans and legumes are excellent. Nuts and seeds minimally processed grains and then like i mentioned you know our good animal proteins like fish turkey chicken eggs some dairy etc we're going to get all into that so the most important thing fiber i feel like i say this all the time and like i feel like i'm just like i'm just like a fiber champion because fiber is the key it really is Fiber is going to feed your good gut bacteria. Fiber is also really important for slowing down digestion, which is going to help manage your blood sugar. So it's going to keep your blood sugar on a nice, even line and prevent any blood sugar insulin spikes or problems. So when I'm talking about fiber-rich foods, they're plant foods, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beads and legumes, nuts and seeds. So all these plant foods contain lots of antioxidants and 
the king of the antioxidants is our polyphenols. So we find our polyphenols typically in our red and purple and blue fruits and vegetables, but they also come in broccoli. Broccoli is an excellent source of polyphenols to chocolate, although not too much. And if you need a guide on chocolate, 72% cocoa or higher is what you want to look for that dark chocolate. Um, coffee and tea are also excellent sources of polyphenols, um, but we're going to talk about coffee and tea and caffeine here in a little bit. So um, moderation is key. But the reason polyphenols are so important, they're antioxidants that help improve our brain function. They help us a lot with focus and attention. Um, they're also one of the foods preferred by our good gut bacteria, so we want to be eating those. Um, and it's also something that can help you make sure that you are increasing the diversity of your good gut bacteria in the microbiome. Vitamin C. Okay, we all know this. Vitamin C is so cool. So everyone's talking about vitamin C now because it's super important, as we know, to our immune health. But the number one organ, the organ that uses the most vitamin C, are actually the, the adrenal glands. So when we're stressed, we actually require a ton of vitamin C. Guess what? You're stressed when you're sick. You're stressed when you're going through mental, emotional, physical stressors as well. So making sure you're including foods that are rich in vitamin C. So um, citrus fruits, berries are very rich in vitamin C. Um, peppers tomatoes. Peppers are actually one of the, um, any bell peppers are actually one of the, um, the food sources that are most high in vitamin C. Parsley randomly is very high in vitamin C. So again, focusing on those plant foods. Vitamin C does lots of other things. It also helps regenerate vitamin E, which is one of our fat soluble vitamins. And it's important for collagen, elastin, and stress hormone production. Vitamin C also helps us with iron absorption. So foods like broccoli and our leafy greens, for instance, are really high in what's called non-heme iron or plant-based iron, but we can't absorb it unless we have a little vitamin C. So throwing some lemon juice on a salad or mixing bell peppers into your salad, great ways to make sure that you maximize your iron. Plant-based fats. So I just want to say for so long, the message was that fat makes us fat. And what we found out definitely over the past 20 years is that fat does not necessarily make us fat. So fat is super important for maintaining blood sugar balance, satiety, and we also need the nutrients from fat, the, the fat soluble vitamins and other things that come in fat. So less is not always more when it comes to fat. So plant-based fats, what do they do? They regulate our blood sugar because they digest slower. They promote satiety, so they make you feel full. You feel way more full when you have a meal with a little fat than you do if you're going for the old chicken and steamed broccoli and a little bit of brown rice. Or tea. They provide um, help. They're one of the building blocks of hormones, so they're important for that. And then absolutely an excellent source of antioxidants. I'm always asked what are my top three sources of plant-based fats. So food sources, the so things that are not oils, um, nuts, seeds, avocados, and olives. And then my top three oils, extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, and coconut oil. But coconut oil isn't a superfood. It doesn't need to be slathered on everything, but used appropriately in dishes where it makes sense. Other things, you want to make sure when you're stressed, you're keeping your protein up. Protein is one of the building blocks for our muscles. So if you're going through a physical stress, this is super important. But it's also important if you're going through mental and emotional stress. Um, those amino acids are really important for helping to lower inflammation. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about things like wild-caught fish, um, free-range or organic eggs. I'm going to just pause on eggs here. Eggs are one of the places where I say spend your bucks at the grocery store. Um, the reason for that is if you get free range and organic, they are higher in omega-3 fatty acids and lower in omega-6 fatty acids. So omega-3 fatty acids are, are anti-inflammatory fatty acids. Omega-6 are pro-inflammatory fatty acids. 
we want more anti-inflammatory acids in the stress state. Um, organic and free-range poultry. We'll talk about uh, we'll talk about chicken thighs here randomly in a second. Uh, Grass-fed and organic meats: beef, pork, and veal. Beans and lentils, nuts and seeds, and fermented soy products, and also other soy products. So if you have soybeans, like soybean nuts or edamame, or absolutely excellent sources of protein. One of my favorite amino acids is L-tyrosine, and this isn't something um, our body can actually make this, but it's a precursor for dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, which are all involved in stress response, and of course. Dopamine is one of our happy hormones. This um, can also help maintain your mental capacity during stressful times and kind of when you have some tyrosine coming into your body through your diet, this can help you feel more rewarded. One of your best sources of tyrosine is dark meat, uh, chicken, or, or poultry. So don't feel like you should always gravitate towards the chicken breast. Choose some of the dark meat chicken or dark meat turkey meat. That is an excellent source of this tyrosine. Mm. So if you haven't noticed by now, I love omega-3s. They're super important. On the American diet, we tend to take in way more omega-6 fatty acids. Um, we actually, it doesn't matter what diet you're on. If you're on a Mediterranean diet, you could be on the cleanest diet in the world, you're still going to take in more omega-6 fatty acids, and that's okay. The key here is bring up the amount of omega-3 fats we have so that we have a more even ratio. So the, the ratio isn't so large between the omega-3s and the omega-6. So why are omega-3s important? They're anti-inflammatory. There are really good studies that show um, improvement in fatigue and also improvement in quality of life when you look at you have people complete questionnaires regarding quality of life before and after starting omega-3 supplements or eating more omega-3 rich food. So food first, um, consider your fatty fish, so salmon, lake trout, herring, sardines, sardines are one of my faves, and tuna. Ground flaxseed, you want to make sure it's ground because if it's a whole flaxseed, all those omega-3s are going to stay in the seed and they're just going to pass right through. So get the ground or grind it yourself. Chia seeds. And then if you are thinking about fish oil supplements, look for a supplement with at least 1.8 grams of EPA and 1.2 grams of DHA. Something to keep in mind. Bone broth. Can I, can I get a, uh, like a shout if anyone makes their own bone broth? I do. Woohoo! Yay! I see some hands. So bone broth is great. Super easy to make too. And I, you know, I'll list a, in the follow-up email, I'll give you guys a really good link to a recipe. So it's rich in L-glutamine, which is the main source of fuel for our intestinal cells. Remember, where does stress start? Where does it manifest? In the gut. So we want to keep that gut nice and healthy. Um, it's also very rich in glycine, which is an anti-inflammatory amino acid. So we love the plants, but we, need, we benefit a little bit from these amino acids that come from animals. All right, so we talked about all the good stuff. Let's talk about the bad stuff. So foods that we want to reduce. Number one on the list is definitely sugar. And I will say it's really hard because when we're stressed, I don't know about you, but I want all the chips and all the cakes and all the sweet beverages and put some sugar in my coffee and all the things. Um, we actually are hardwired to have that response because when we're in a stress State, our body just thinks we need more energy and the easiest way to get an energy is through carbohydrates. So don't tell yourself you can't have it, but instead really work on becoming more mindful about when you have it. So if I'm gonna eat chips with my parents, because they always seem to have chips around, using that as an example, then I'm gonna remember that I had them on Monday and I'm not going to eat them on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or whatever the case might be. If I put sugar in my coffee on Tuesday, I'm not going to do it for the rest of the week. When we have a lot of sugar, it becomes addictive, and then we want more and more of it. It's actually more addictive than cocaine, and sugar has, it, it just increases inflammation in our body and is linked to basically every inflammatory condition. So we're talking about autoimmune diseases, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, diabetes, you name it, inflammation usually plays some sort of 
Too much sugar can also lead to insulin resistance. So that means our blood sugars aren't being managed quickly should and that can cause you to gain more weight around the world. Caffeine. So I love coffee probably more than, than the next guy, but definitely I'm a coffee person all the way. But mm -hmm. having too much caffeine is basically just a whip to the adrenal glands. So it's great to have a little stimulation with the form of caffeine, but if you're pounding coffee all day long, you're just whipping those adrenal glands and they're going to get tired. So it's not going to help your stress response. Caffeine also increases your heart rate. And then, of course, you have to deal with those headaches caused by caffeine dependence. Um, a good rule of thumb is limiting your caffeine to 8 to 12 ounces per day. 12 is totally fine. Um, skipping sugar and artificial sweeteners so we can lower the sugar intake is great. I cannot say enough good things about green tea. You get about 50 milligrams of caffeine in there, but you also have a lot of L-theanine. L-theanine is something that helps promote alpha brain waves. So this has been shown to be really helpful in students taking tests, actually. Um, it can lower the stress response and kind of bring things down into a more natural state, and get us out of fight or flight, but still provide a little bit of, of help from a stimulation perspective. So go for the green tea. Okay, I said a lot of things today. How do we put this in practice in easy ways? Number one, I'm probably going to say this again throughout the course of these webinars. And if you're a client of mine, then you've seen this, I'm sure. Uh, but the plate is so powerful. We treat our, our meals kind of like puzzles and make sure that we have all the pieces and parts on there. We're going to manage our blood sugar. We're going to feed our good gut bugs good gut bacteria, and we're going to make sure we're getting in the protein we need that's going to help us stay nice. So step one, fill half your plate with non-starchy vegetables. So that's everything except potatoes, peas, and corn. Guys, non-starchy vegetables are your food as medicine. They give you fiber. They give you antioxidants. If you think about that and start with those vegetables, you're going to be in a really good Second thing you want to look at are your starchy vegetables. So potatoes, peas, corn, and then whole grains. So bread, cereal, rice, pasta, quinoa, all that good stuff. So it should be about a quarter of the size of your plate or about the size of your fist. If you're not as active, you may want to think about reducing that a little bit just because this is where most of our carbohydrates hang out on the there's nothing wrong with these though, and completely eliminating them from your diet oftentimes is not helpful. Um, and then we talk about protein. So somewhere between four to six ounces of protein is an appropriate amount, and you should be looking at about the size of the palm of your hand or a little bigger. So I'm 4'11", um, I should be eating less protein than the six foot tall dude I might be working out with or something like that. So something to keep in mind. Generally speaking, nobody needs more than about six ounces of protein at a time because we can only absorb about 40 or less grams of protein at a time. So guys, if you're listening, bodybuilders, working out a lot, um, more is not always necessary. Last but not least, I kept talking about fat and I'm going to talk about it again. Having about a serving of plant-based fat and on this particular plate, you'll see I have about I think I have a, one and a half teaspoons of avocado based, um, I mean, avocado oil mayonnaise, which is my dipping sauce for my fries. And then I have some extra virgin olive oil on my vegetable. That's going to help maintain good blood sugar and help you feel nice and good. Snacking can also be really helpful when you think about your snacks a little bit strategically. So you want to make sure you're pairing fiber. So fruits, veggies, and whole grains with something that has plant-based fat or protein. So examples of this is going to be like an apple and peanut butter or a handful of nuts, carrots and guacamole. Um, you can do other things too, like a plain yogurt with half a cup of berries, all great choices. This pairing of the fiber with fat or protein is going to help increase your satiety and help you balance your blood sugar. I keep saying those two things, right? Those are the keys to eating healthy, 
and also making sure you're managing your stress response. Meal timing. So generally speaking, most people want to be eating three to four times per day. It's actually really important to have about four hours in between your meals. You may find you need, you have to eat before that and that's totally fine. But our digestive system benefits from the rest that we get when we go about four hours in between meals. Intermittent fasting is something that's been a really hot topic lately. Um, there's good research on this for decreasing fatigue and improving your insulin response. Um, absolutely something you can use. My favorite way to use intermittent flat fasting is to fast anywhere between 12 and 16 hours. There is no magic necessarily in 16 hours. You need to play around with these and see what works best for you. I know for me that if I fast for 16 hours, I am hangry. I'm going to overeat at my next meal, and it's, it's not a fit for me. Um, but 12 hours, so not eating after dinner and then waiting 12 hours and eating breakfast 12 hours later works really well for me personally. I like this technique too because typically you stop eating after dinner. So if you have that hard stop, it cuts out some of that mindless eating or drinking that happens in the evening time. If you are under a lot of stress, that 16 hour, or there's sometimes you'll even see people doing like full day fasts that's usually not a great choice for you because this can increase cortisol levels. And if you're really stressed out, your cortisol, cortisol levels are already high and you don't want help in that. Department. All right, let's talk adaptogens. So some of my favorite things. So ashwagandha is an herbal supplement. It's extremely gentle and calming. It's kind of like a pillow for the adrenal glands. I love it because there's no significant drug interactions. It's also safe in, during pregnancy and nursing. And this can be very helpful if you take it daily. So this is something you don't take just when you feel stressed. You want to take it daily. Um, it can help a little bit with pain reduction, but especially decreased stress and just the ability to be a little bit more resilient. Rhodiola is a really interesting one, too. It's, called, it's um, under the category of psychostimulants. So it can have some really powerful antidepressant effects um, in people that have more depression associated with stress. Um, it's also been studied in students and improves attention and cognitive performance. I do want you to be aware, um, there are, you don't want to take this if you're taking warfarin or sulfonylureas. Um, and there are some side effects. Some people get headaches, feel nauseous. So this is one of those that may be a good fit for some people and not for others. Valerian. A lot of people when they're having stress, they have trouble sleeping. So a combination of valerian and what I'll talk about next is amazing and well studied. Um, valerian is a mild sedative and sleep aid. What you need to make sure you're doing is you use it for two to four weeks consistently before you decide whether it's effective or not. Sometimes it takes a while to build up. And what you want to use this in conjunction with is lemon balm. Before we get to lemon balm, I just want to make note that um, it can increase sedative properties of things like benzodiazepines, barbiturates, St. John's, kava, and melatonin. So just be aware if you're taking any of those. Lemon balm is another type of um, plant that can help, that when used in conjunction um, with the valerian can be very effective for sleep. Lemon balm itself helps stimulate GABA, which is that kind of resting return to normal neurotransmitter and this is really helpful in people whose sleep is interrupted interrupted due to anxiety um, if you are taking thyroid medications or antiretroviral medications you may want to talk to your doctor before you just start using this um, you'll notice that on all these slides i have um, labels from my favorite company herb farm they do an excellent job making organic and effective products um, for all these adaptogens in your body. Last one I want to talk about is my personal favorite. It's passion flower and it's excellent for situational anxiety. Again, it helps increase GABA and it also counters excited neurotransmitters. So if you're feeling that oh, feeling like you just got, you know, you read something in the news that made you upset or you just got off the phone and had a difficult conversation, passion flower can be very uh, helpful. You can also take it when you are going through that situational anxiety moment. So you don't have to take it every day.
Um, there is quite the list here of drug interactions, so um, please beware of all of that. So if you're interested in any of these supplements, you can actually uh, purchase them through me. I will provide this link in the email you'll get with the recording of this webinar. Um, and if you sign up, I will give you a direct link that will list all of the supplements that I mentioned, and it will tell you like what they're for and any drug interactions. So you don't have to remember anything right now. So if you're like, oh, I want to get that one for situational anxiety. I can't remember what it's called. It'll be on the list and you can click and order it if you so desire. You also get 15% off all supplements for life. And disclaimer, I do um, make a small commission from uh, Emerson Ecologics that runs the Wellevate program. Um, I love them because they are so great at sourcing quality supplements. I trust them way more than most of the supplement companies out there. Also, if you don't have a lot of structure and you're looking for some help when it comes to planning, shopping, and cooking, I do have a program that may be a, a good fit for you. So there are two webinars that kind of go through how to structure your plate at your meals, um, talk about what foods you should be eating versus what foods you may want to eat less of. And then also a step-by-step -step guide to planning, shopping, and cooking, because we know so much of this is all about planning. This is actually social distancing time is a great time to do this because we're trying to only go to the store once and we're trying to plan for a week, which is how I like to look at things. This actually helps you stay on track when it comes to a meal prep and eating perspective. Uh, you also get a month's access to a meal plan based on your nutritional needs. So if you're interested, this will also be in the email for you to sign up as well. And this is $37 through the end of May. So you get a good deal on it this, during this time. And if you have any questions, connect with me anyway, Facebook, Instagram, over email. I'm happy to chat with you. Um, let me take some questions. Does anybody have any questions about what we talked about today? I have a question. Yes. Trish. <laughs> Um, when you were mentioning the green tea, do you have any recommendations or do you support um, like any other types of tea, herbal or black tea for other things or is it mainly just green? Yeah, so tea is fabulous. A couple things you want to think about when you're buying tea, trying to get organic is really important because tea actually can carry a lot of pesticides. So if you're buying like a big box brand like Lipton or something like that that's not organic, you're probably getting more pesticides in there than you want. So I really like um, the Yogi brand. Any kind of like herbal teas, and herbal teas can do different things for, for different purposes. Like ginger tea is awesome if you're having some abdominal stomach issues, some GI issues. Um, lemon can also be another good one for stomach issues. Um, you know, there's some good sleep teas out there as well. Chamomile to help you relax. I'm a huge fan of herbal tea, just if you like the flavor. But most important thing is trying to find organic teas. Did I answer your question, Trish? Yep. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? Um, yes, I have a question. This is Sandy. Hi, um, Is Hi. I live up in Marblehead. So we have a lot of perch and walleye up here. Is that considered to be wild? Great question. So yes. If you're, yes, it is considered wild, unless it specifically says farm raised. I don't believe there are any no. fish farms in the area. So yes, it is. Um, one thing to just note about Lake Erie fish, Lake Erie, any of the Great Lakes fish, they tend to contain a lot of mercury. So what I always caution people about is just not to eat it every day. Okay. But it is a great source of omega-3s. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? I got one, Gretchen. Yes. I'm like a two-year-old with vegetables. Can I put them <laughs> in my smoothie? Absolutely. You can you can hide them however you want. <laughs> um, greens go really well in smoothies. I find that um, like a baby kale or a spinach tends to tends to hide itself rather well. Um, and then Chris, do you ever roast your vegetables? That's literally the only way I can eat them. Yeah. Roast them all, okay. every kind. Sweet. <laughs>
<laughs> I've also heard good things about the air fryer and putting your vegetables in the air fryer. I just don't have one. Oh. Gretchen, I will say that I tried air frying frozen vegetables last week and it worked really, really well. Really? Oh. Yeah. What so, kind, Sarah? Broccoli. Oh, nice. Yeah. It, it worked really well. You just had to um, do it a little bit longer and make sure you toss them a couple times because they're defrosting while they're in, you know, the basket. But it worked incredibly well. Thank you for sharing your pro tip. Yeah, any, anytime. Any other questions? Hey, Gretchen, this is Brittany Cermak. Hey, Brittany. How are you? I'm good. What's going good. on? Good. Great. Great presentation. I, um, I'm kind of new to the whole like adaptogens and those types of things. Um, I was wondering if you had any suggestions on how you actually take that. Is that something you would just like dissolve in water to drink or do you like put it on your wrist? Like I know it like looks kind of like an essential oil thing. So can you can explain that a little bit more? Thank you, Brittany. Such an excellent question. So I really like the herb farm tinctures and that's what you'll get in your list if you sign up through Wellovate. Um, and I like them because number one, they're, they're liquid, they're liquid drops. You put them in water. They don't taste bad. They kind of taste like an herbal tea that you put in water. So you put it in any between ounces of water, whatever you want. And um, I like the tinctures instead of pills because they actually absorb better into your system. So it's literally like making a tea out of like a liquid concentrate. And then do you just follow the recommendation for the dosage that's listed on the bottle? Yep, I just follow the, the dosage on the bottle, generally speaking. Um, if you feel like it's not working for you or something like that, uh, you can always talk with a practitioner like myself who knows you know a little bit more about the dosing, but a great, and, and that's another thing I like about Herb Farm is the dosing on the bottles is, is very, it's very good. Great, thank you so much. Welcome. Anyone else, any questions? Hi Gretchen, it's Denise. Hi. Hi, can you discuss elderberry extract? Yes, okay, yes. So elderberry is one, it's, it's, not, it's not an adaptogen, but it is an herbal extract and it's really helpful for immunity. And um, what it does is it helps to kind of upregulate your cytokine production. So it can help you fight off, you know, viruses and bacteria, things like that. So it's been shown to be very effective, really decent studies. They're not the biggest studies, but decent studies um, on elderberry's effectiveness when it comes to the flu, so influenza A and B. Um, however, we do have a little bit of concern when it comes to COVID-19 and elderberry. So I just first want to say there's no studies on this because it's a new virus. So, you know, no one's, no one's spending their time researching elderberry and COVID-19 right now, really. We do know that at the, when you're in acute respiratory distress with the coronavirus, you have what's called a cytokine storm or an upregulation of cytokines in your respiratory system and your lungs. And this is super unhelpful and it, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, one of the things that elderberry does is it also increases the production of cytokines. Um, so if you have both of those things working at the same time, it is thought that that is not helpful. Now, again, we don't have great studies on this, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always somebody that is a little bit conservative on these things. So I think at this time, it's a good idea to discontinue elderberry use. Um, the University of Arizona's Andrew Wheel Center for Functional, I mean, for Integrative Medicine has also come out recently and said the same thing. Um, if you Google that, there's a really good paper that they have on supplements in light of COVID-19. So put the elderberry back on the shelf for now. It's going to last a while. It's expensive. You know, use it next flu season. We don't have to worry about this, hopefully. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Um, are there any other supplements we should be taking in light of COVID? Like, should we take vitamin C supplements? Should we take um, vitamin E? Is there anything else that we should just take as a supplement versus a food? Sure. So, you know, it's going to vary from person to person. Um, but generally speaking, vitamin C, I think, is the most powerful supplement to be taking right now. 
Um, between 500 to 1,000 milligrams is a good dose. I like liposomal vitamin C a lot. Um, it's really hard to find right now because everything's sold out. But that's a really gentle, it's very gentle on the stomach and easy for your body to digest. But honestly, any kind of vitamin C you can find, emergency, you name it, you know, at your, at your grocery store, at, uh, at Walgreens or wherever, that's going to be good for now. The good news about vitamin C is that um, it, it, it is able to be absorbed in the body fairly easily. Gretchen, what about vitamin D? So vitamin D, you know, I think everybody on the call right now is in Cleveland or at least in the upper half of the US. So we still need to be making sure we're optimizing our vitamin D levels right now. However, um, one of the findings from the paper that I mentioned from the Andrew Wheel Integrative Center is that vitamin D um, can be involved again in producing some of those, or triggering some of the production of those cytokines. So what I'm telling my patients right now is if you do come down with a COVID-19 or if you're having symptoms, I would stop the vitamin D until your symptoms stop. Hmm. But keep taking your vitamin D because we do need it. It's a fine line. How much is appropriate? Um, it depends on who you are. Uh, I definitely suggest getting tested once a year to see where your levels are. And if you need to get a mega dose, uh, that's a good idea. So ask your doctor. It should get covered through insurance. Um, but a good maintenance dose is between 1,000 to 2,000 IV per day. Good question. Thanks, Sarah. You guys have such good questions. Anything else? Hey, Gretchen. Oh, wow. It's yes. Mary Ellen Tramick. How are you? Hey, Mary Ellen. How are you? Good. Hey, Trish. Hey, um, it, this is a goofy question. Recently, I've been reading more about lectins from plant-based foods that they, from plant-based proteins that they can actually counteract um like anti-inflammatory anti diet is that true it depends on who you are so if you are having if you have an autoimmune condition or you are having digestive symptoms or experiencing a lot of fatigue skin rashes i definitely suggest um talking with your doctor and then meeting with a functional dietitian like me um, <laughs> who can help you kind of navigate that because our beans and legumes, which are high in lectins, are also a really great source of the fiber and, and other nutrients that are going to help you stay healthy. So um, it, it's worth working with somebody who can kind of help you navigate that. Right. I was like, oh my God, that Everything I've learned from Gretchen is counteractive, counterintuitive. No, so I honestly, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I don't love in eliminating those things unless we have a true reason to. Right. And Mary Ellen, if you want to message me about that um, offline, I'm happy to talk to you a little bit more about it. Okay, cool. No, but that, I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> All right, I'm actually gonna stop this right now just because it's, it's 40 minutes and we went 10 minutes over, but thank you so much for joining me. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time for this. There'll be a recording and then any of those links that I mentioned, you'll get an email later today. Um, and then hopefully I will see you all next week. Thanks Gretchen. Thanks everyone. Thanks Gretchen. Thanks, Gretchen. Bye. Bye, have a good Bye. day. Bye. Bye gang. Bye Mary Ellen. <laughs>